In the extreme southeastern corner of Portugal's Algarve lie the border towns of Castro Marim and Vila Real de Santo Antonio. They are a 30 minute or so car or bus ride from Faro, or if you're into diesel trains, that's an option as well. The area at the mouth of the Guadiana River has been inhabited for thousands of years, to the Neolithic period to be not so exact. Castro Marim actually dates back about 5,000 years BC. Originally, for thousands of years, it was a port for the ships going up and down the Guadiana River, carrying copper from nearby mines. The Guadiana River actually forms a border between Portugal and Spain, which you can see behind me in the background. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the Moors moved in. If you watched my History of Portugal video, you'll know that Afonso I claimed himself the first king of Portugal by kicking some serious Moorish butt. And this Moorish butt kicker had a son, Sancho. In fact, he had three legitimate sons, but Sancho was the only one to survive infancy. When Sancho became king in 1185, he abandoned any insignificant battles and consolidated his efforts south against the Moors, capturing the important and busy trading post of Silves in 1191. He quickly fortified the town and built a castle, which is today by far the best preserved castle in the Algarve. During his reign, one small act of, we'll call it kindness, would prove large. He donated some land to the Order of Santiago. One of those knights would be the Portuguese-born Pio Perez Correa, who under Sancho II led his army on a conquest through the eastern part of Alentejo and into the eastern Algarve, and settlers would soon follow. In 1242, Castro Merim was officially won. After Sancho II's removal from the throne, Correa would go on to help Afonso III put the finishing touches on the remaining Moorish strongholds in 1249. Afonso III was now known as the King of Portugal and the Algarve. Spain, or Castile as it was known then, insisted that the land was theirs. Instead of battling them, both signed the Treaty of Badajoz on February the 16th, 1267, in which Alfonso X of Castile would relinquish all claims to the Algarve and that the Guadiana River would form the natural border between the two countries. And it has remained the same border ever since. Its proximity to Spain and the defeated Moors licking their wounds across the strait, Afonso III had the area of Castro Marin populated by ordering the reconstruction and renovation of the castle. On orders from Pope John XXII, Castro Marim was donated, due to its strength, to the Military Order of Christ, the successors of the disbanded Knights Templar, and it became their headquarters. However, the castle was abandoned when the order moved their headquarters north to Tomar and gave the rights back to the Order of Santiago, who built the church inside the castle walls. Succeeding kings all deemed the castle important and strategic given its location overlooking their neighbor. Kings John I, Afonso V, and Manuel I would not let it go and kept encouraging settlement by creating work either on restoration or in fisheries or mining. During the Portuguese Restoration War with Spain from 1640 to 1668, King John IV had the fort of San Sebastian constructed to help ward off invasion. After the earthquake and tsunami of 1755, which destroyed pretty well everything, King Joseph I had the town rebuilt outside the castle walls and also had the castle itself reconstructed. He also founded the nearby town of Villa Real de Santo Antonio on the flats at the mouth of the river. His right-hand man, the Marquis of Pombal, who was instrumental in Portugal's rebuild, decided to use a grid system similar to what was being used in the reconstruction of Lisbon, a sort of experiment. His Pombaline architecture was an early experimentation with earthquake-proofing buildings. It consisted of low, wide, rather plain military barrack-style buildings which were prefabricated and encased a wooden framework. The idea was not to prevent damage, but rather to prevent crumbling, which caused the extraordinary loss of life. The simplicity of the grid system would later make the town an easy choice to be the first in the Algarve to have gas street lighting installed in 1886. At one time here, the fishing industry flourished. 
sardines and bluefin tuna being the most profitable. But winds changed, market laws changed, overfishing and pollution all led to a huge decline around the 1960s. Fishing is still a big part of the local commerce and everyday life throughout the region. But in 1986, when Portugal joined the European Economic Community, which is now known as the European Union, the borders were opened and the tourists poured in, attracted by the relative cheapness and, of course, the beaches. Thanks for watching.